So Manly dared me to put this up. Boy, he's got a big head. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you would, uh, please rise for the arrival of His Excellency, the Right Honourable David Johnson, Governor General of Canada. Mesdames et Messieurs, voulez-vous lever, s'il vous plaît, pour l'arrivée, le son, uh, Excellence de très honorable, David Johnson, Governor General du Canada. You're also allowed to clap. Uh, it's my great pleasure. Uh, this is a, a golden opportunity to have His Excellency here, here where I, I get to talk and I get the microphone. <laughs> well, His Excellency the Right Honourable David Johnson, the 28th Governor General of Canada, has dedicated his life to public service. A strong believer in both equality of opportunity and excellence, he has spent most of his career in higher ed as a professor and later administrator and president of several of Canada's leading universities. His Excellency has focused his mandate on strengthening learning and innovation, philanthropy and volunteerism in families and children. Since his installation as Governor General in October of 2010, Mr. Johnson has traveled widely across Canada and the world, connecting, honoring and inspiring Canadians and their global partners. Uh, so with that, I, I'd like to ask the uh, Governor General if he'd come up and, and speak about something that he's very passionate about, and I'll, I'll warn you that I, I really set expectations high this morning. Thank you, Fred. Tom, thank you very much for a, a generous introduction. Tom and I have known one another for a very long time, and that introduction could have been a lot different than the one you just heard. Your Honour, Parliamentarians, National Chief Bellegarde, old friend, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with a question. Are we innovative or aren't we? As Canadians, I mean, is this a nation of innovators or is it not? Depending on who you ask, you'll get a different answer. There are plenty of articles, reports, and anecdotes to say both. And what that tells me is that while Canadians are innovative, we lack a culture of innovation in Canada. We lack a culture of innovation in Canada. And I think that building that culture of innovation with a focus on unleashing talent, and that will be my focus today, talent, will help to move beyond 2% growth in Canada. But first, let me define what I mean by innovation. It's not invention. Innovation is an economic and social process a means by which productivity is improved and better ways of organizing and operating are achieved as a society. And it's very busy, the movement along that spectrum. It's about developing new ways of doing things and creating value, value that will stimulate growth. Aujourd'hui, je veux vous expliquer le processus en six étapes qui, selon moi, permettra de créer une culture de l'innovation au Canada et par la même de stimuler la croissance. One, let's go global with learning and research. Two, let's turn Canada into a global talent hub. Three, let's support those who are being left behind. Quatrièmement, nous devons avoir des ententes plus élevées pour l'excellence au niveau international. Cinquièmement, nous devons célébrer nos réalisations ici chez nous. And six, let's put innovation at the core of talent development at every stage. Simple, right? Let's elaborate. First, going global in our learning. Nous devrions aider les étudiants à poursuivre une partie de leurs études postsecondaires à l'étranger. 
Au Canada, de nombreuses améliorations sont encore possibles en ce domaine. According to University of Canada's most recent survey, just over 3%, just over 3% of Canadian undergraduates studied abroad or worked in a volunteer capacity during their degree. They cited factors such as cost, curricula, and lack of interest in or understanding of the benefits of international study as reasons why. Compare our 3% number with that of our Australian counterparts, 17% of whom now study abroad at some point. Australia's success follows a concerted effort by a range of actors in that country. And in fact, in Norway, the Norwegian government uh, supports 100% of their undergraduate students taking a year abroad. They provide the full cost support for any student who wishes to undertake such study. Together, in particular Australia, they've permitted the benefits of studying abroad, created opportunities and developed options for students that take account of barriers such as cost and time. Given the strength of our public education system, I think we can go even further. Pourquoi est-ce que c'est important? En plus de tout le bagage de connaissances et d'expériences qu'elle apporte, les études à l'étranger comportent des avantages pour le Canada. I'd just like to make a personal reference to that. Uh, all the important things in life I've learned from my children and now from my 14 grandchildren. My five daughters began studying abroad or being exposed to different cultural experiences at age 12. <clears throat> Four things happened to them in their formation, which was stri quite striking. One, they became more curious. Two, they became more tolerant. Tolerant in the sense of not you're different, I accept that, but tolerant in the sense that I'm interested in what makes you different. Thirdly, their judgments became better because they looked for the other side of the story, the different angle on things. And fourthly, they became more empathetic, not just sympathetic, but empathetic to walk in the other person's shoes. And that, of course, is a great formation, a great foundation for innovative thinking. Currently, Canada is not a top-tier global destination for foreign students. More Canadian students abroad will help to raise our profile and build global networks which can only help us attract more international students. It will also help us attract the best talent, which brings me to my second point, transforming Canada into a global talent hub. Selon moi, une avenue prometteuse consiste à soutenir les personnes de talent et à les attirer et à les amener à rester, Canadiens ou non. We have so many bright, creative, and skilled people in this country. And there are so many talented and entrepreneurial people out there in the world just looking for a place to happen. There are many avenues for improvement. Consider the case close to home with NAFTA, for example. Dominic Barton will be speaking this evening, and as he has pointed out, NAFTA could use a jump start. We could do much more to recruit and retain the best North American talent. We could simplify our immigration processes and ease restrictions on relocation and the flow of people. Nous pourrions faire preuve de stratégie et cible, par exemple, les déployés du Mexique ou les Canadiens qui vivent à l'étranger. We could improve our workforce training to address skills gap. And I think all of you in this room are familiar with people whose foreign credentials have not been appropriately recognized to do similar work here. <clears throat> We could become much more ambitious in our efforts to build a smart, caring, and dynamic country and get better at telling our story abroad. We can do all of this with a view to improving the flow of talent into Canada and out to the world as talent ambassadors. Last year, following the presentation of the inaugural Governor General's Innovation Awards, and more on that later, we held a forum on innovation, and one of our contributors was Neil Turek, director of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, which I should say last week uh, just announced uh, uh, the um, Nobel Prize in economics uh, for one of its uh, holders of uh, distinguished visiting research chair. We'll see many more Nobel Prizes coming out of Perimeter. Neil pointed out that the Perimeter Institute is home to a master's program of 30 students and that 21 nationalities from around the world are represented. Just think about that for a moment. 30 students, 21 nationalities. What a wonderful mixture that is. 
Cet exemple montre comment le Canada peut être un haut lieu de savoir pour des candidats talentueux du monde entier. Canada needs to become a magnet for talented young people, Neil said. The world needs special places where people can think about big questions. I share Neil's view. Canada should be a place where people come together to study, discover, and innovate. We can only prosper as a result. Now let me move to my third point. We must be a caring nation. Nous avons beaucoup de raisons d'être fiers, mais il nous reste aussi beaucoup de travail. Let me focus again on education, which is so critical to all we seek to achieve. A few years ago, the OECD produced a study which attempted to trace social mobility by the degree to which children met or exceeded their parents' level of education. And they looked at the 30 or 31, 32 countries in the OECD, and they, they analyzed them based on that progression, that movement. Guess what? They divided the populations into quintiles, 20% each. Canada was number one in the top four quintiles, the top 80% of populations measured. Children met or exceeded their parents' level of education by a greater amount than any other country. And you think, gee, that is terrific, don't you? And you would say, the bottom 20%, we gotta be up there in the top one, two, three. A rising tide raises all boats, not so. We're in the bottom third in that last 20% in the degree to which children meet or exceed or don't meet their parents' level of education. And there are areas of our country, Perry knows them well, our indigenous population, 4% of the population of country, rapidly growing younger people, where the educational opportunities are simply dramatically different than those for non-Aboriginal people, a challenge for us. And in sections of our large cities where you have pockets of population that simply don't enjoy the equality of opportunity that is such a cherished Canadian value, we have work to do. We can do better, we must do better. Ce n'est pas seulement les bonnes choses à faire, mais aussi les cho la chose la plus intelligente à faire. Dans le monde d'aujourd'hui, la seule vraie prospérité est la prospérité commune. Fourth, let's raise our expectations and compete for global excellence. But what do I mean by global excellence? Simply that Canadians are competing for the world's top prizes, no matter the discipline. In fact, that Nobel Prize that I mentioned a moment ago at Perimeter it's held by a professor at Princeton University, a great institution, of course, but spends a part of his time at Perimeter contributing to the Canadian development of very creative physics. Tout comme aux Olympiques, uh, nous devrons nous mesurer à l'élite mondiale dans tout ce que nous faisons afin de relever la barre et d'attirer l'attention du monde sur le Canada. In fact, Canadian researchers have had a good run of late. Last year, 24 Canadians won prestigious international awards and prizes in science, engineering, health, medicine, the social sciences, and humanities. And that's up from 11 awards, from 11 to 24, 11 awards in our baseline year of 2012. It's important because the, the cost and complexity of contemporary research often means we must collaborate globally. And we must encourage our citizens to realize that investments in this kind of excellence is very good for everyone in the country. And receiving that acclaim from outside is very helpful in developing that support at the grassroots level in Canada. Les prix ont aussi de l'importance dans un univers mondial où la concurrence pour les talents et les ressources est grande. Nothing attracts and retains talent and resources better than success at the international level. That's why we're working with Canada's granting councils and other research and innovation partners on the Global Excellence Initiative which aims to ensure the work of Canada's most talented is nominated for the top international awards and prizes. And as they say in hockey, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Fifth, I want to talk about celebrating our achievements here at home. Comme je l'ai dit à l'instant, cette année à Rideau Hall, nous avons procédé à la première remise des prix du Gouverneur Général pour l'innovation. Six personnes ont été récompensées, and you'll see one of those six in the panel shortly to follow. We did this because we dream of a country that honors its most creative, compassionate, and entrepreneurial citizens. We did it because we dream of a country that celebrates those who create value, who build compassionate, inclusive communities, and improve our quality of life. We did it because we dream 
of a country that celebrates those who reject complacency and put their creativity and skills to use. We want to strengthen the culture of innovation in Canada. Some of the world's top innovators live among us, yet we don't share our stories or highlight that fact enough. Nous voulons qu'ils ont largement connu, bien au-delà des limites de communauté d'innovation ou de technologie. By celebrating and sharing their stories widely, we build that culture, we foster it. What we're trying to do is help all Canadians embrace a culture that sees innovation as part of what makes us Canadian, part of our DNA. By celebrating great innovation stories, we help people see what it means to create value and to say, hey, I can do that too. Another way to think of celebration is as a teaching tool, the point I made a moment ago. We want people to understand that good things come of innovation, that change is a friend, not an enemy, and therefore to support initiatives that improve our lives and society. En soulignant la créativité au Canada, dans plusieurs domaines, nous voulons montrer que l'innovation est essentielle au progrès de l'humanité. So, my message to you is find ways to encourage and honor excellence wherever you will and wherever you see it. Help us tell this story to all Canadians. Let's strive to make innovation a pillar of Canadian culture. Sixth and finally, let's place innovation at the core of our talent development system. And what does that entail? Well, it means everything I've just outlined and more. Encouraging Canadians to view the world as their stage while bringing the world to Canada. Seeking out the most talented people and working hard to bring them to Canada. Raising educational levels and employment opportunities for the most vulnerable and marginalized Canadians. Competing on the global stage with the world's best, celebrating our achievements at home. Tous ces éléments devraient faire partie de notre système de perfectionnement des talents, à chaque étape de l'apprentissage ou du travail, et du travail. A culture of innovation does not happen by accident, but by countless daily acts and sustained efforts over time. It happens because we make it happen. It happens because we believe that to be innovative lies at the heart of what it means to be Canadian. To ask, how do we do things better? And then, do just that is part of the basic makeup of our country. That is, after all, what all of you are doing here at this gathering today. I thank all of you for your continued commitment to Canada's growth and prosperity. Je vous souhaite un bon sommet. Have an enlightening summit. Merci. Stay here. Merci beaucoup, à Son Excellence, euh, d'avoir été un gouverneur général qui a, qui a gardé les mêmes messages pendant tout son, son mandat, l'importance de l'innovation et de talent, puis c'était consistant pendant tous ces messages euh, de son mandat. On a un petit moment pour une période de questions. Um, the Governor General has kindly um, accepted to uh, answer a few of your questions this morning. And so if you can go up to one of the three mics, and he will uh, be willing to take some of your questions. Um, if I can start, um, Excellency, um, yourself in terms of your career, having committed so much of your career in the post-secondary realm, and yourself, you were a bit of a disruptor in the higher education system. And I wondered um, if you had some thoughts about how that system is being disrupted or is yet to be disrupted, the college and university system in Canada. Well, I think it's important in that sector, uh, as in others, perhaps more important in that sector. And um, I think the greatest contribution one can make to developing uh, disruptive initiatives is to have a very broad diversity uh, in the community, a community that uh, thinks uh, outwardly um, and uh, is quite prepared to measure itself against the best in the world. Uh, in the, um, the teams that I've been uh, privileged to uh, be a part of, um, at McGill and um, at Waterloo and now in my current job, uh, it, it's been very, very diverse. Um, if I just think of the, uh, the makeup of um, our team members, uh, it's been talent drawn from all the world. Just to cite Waterloo, for example, uh, my marvelous partner, uh, Ahmed Chakma, uh, is a native of Bangladesh. Um, his successor, when Ahmed went off to be president of Western University, uh, was Feridun Hamdalopper, who came here from Turkey. 
And uh, those perspectives have been uh, wonderfully important and they're, they ripple through the institution. In my own uh, situation, Julie, uh, I grew up in a small town in northern Ontario and um, I had the good fortune to, um, to go to Harvard. I began my discussions there at, in grade 10 thanks to an alumnus who was looking for youngsters who were good students and good athletes. And when it came time for my application to go in, my high school principal, who was a very good man and a good person, refused to write the letter of recommendation for me. Um, he said, I don't want you to go into a third-rate U.S. university. I said, well, I'm sure there's some third-rate ones there, as there are here, and second-rate ones, but this one is a good one. You know it well, Harvard. And he says, well, if you go there, you'll probably be lost to Canada. I said, I think I'll not be lost to Canada, uh, but, you know, <clears throat> I should go and spread my wings. He said, no, I won't write the letter. It was part of an attitude, which was not a disruptive attitude. So I went to the football coach, who was uh, also the history teacher. He says, I'll write the bloody letter for you. He says, you've been a big frog in a very small pond. You've got to go and get your head knocked off by people that are a lot tougher and faster than you. <laughs> and on the football field, they were. Um, and for me, that attitude was very important, that you, uh, uh, one, seek diversity, and two, somehow ratchet up your expectations so they're very high. And if I had one message for uh, every, all of you here with respect to our universities, raise your expectations. Expect more of us. Um, the Times Higher Education uh, rating of world universities came out a couple weeks ago. We have three universities in the top 100, and we have uh, six or seven in the top 200. The King of Holland was with us um, about a week, a year ago, and I remember saying to him, uh, King Willem, I'm so impressed with, with Holland. You have uh, seven of your universities in the top 100 in the Times list. Um, that's impressive. You're half the size of our country. You've got four or five times the number of universities in the top 100. He says, well, thank you very much for your compliment. He said, we have 18 in the top 200. I said, how many universities do you have? We have 97 that are accredited. He said, 20 and number 20 will be in the top 200 next year. That's raised expectations, that's what we need. Thank you, longer answers than I should have given. Thank you, um, we'll go to the floor for a question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Annie Kidder and I'm with a public education research and advocacy organization, so I wanna take this down even younger. Uh, Minister Baines talked about talent, Roberta Jamison talked about education, you talked about education a lot. We have an interesting, in a difficult maybe sense of the word situation in Canada where kindergarten and grade 12 education is very much a provincial jurisdiction and hopefully this isn't too political a question but what and we happen to think that that's where we're beginning to you know build and grow those innovators is starting in early childhood all the way up through grade 12 into post-secondary so what is the role for a federal government notwithstanding the provincial jurisdiction in public education in encouraging or building uh, or, or helping to ensure that we have a uh, have public education systems uh, that are that are building those broad competencies and skills that lead us to have yeah. uh, you know creative innovators who are going to think about our long-term well-being and our prosperity. Yeah. I've never worried much about our, our federation and the decentralization of powers. Uh, in 1867, when it was written, we didn't think of universities. We said education is a provincial preserve. Had we thought of universities, we probably would have struck a different arrangement. But you look at nations that do have a Secretary of Education, like the United States, a declared federal role. I'm not sure they've done better in terms of their public education. Where the Americans have done brilliantly, of course, is in their great institutions, particularly private ones, but some of the public ones who are at the pinnacle levels of excellence. And that's partly federal government support, but it's also support by the graduates of their institutions and the people who come to places like MIT and say, uh, this is a place where talent can flourish. And so our federal government does have a substantial role in research and also in supporting students, which are two pre-key areas. Love to see that expanded, uh, make the case for it. Uh, but I wouldn't begin by saying we have to reconfigure the actual responsibilities. What I do think we have to do is, is develop the case for investment in talent so that every Canadian says, if you want to do one thing to make this a better country for all, you'll see investment in talent and therefore innovation is an absolute crucial piece of the part. Um, our board chair this morning uh, 
started the day talking about the importance of literacy and essential skills. And of, perhaps of what? literacy and essential sure. skills, and perhaps some of the, the unknown myths around literacy and essential skills in a country like Canada, which yeah. is known as being so strong in the field of education. Yeah. And I know that within your mandate, you've, you've given a focus to literacy and essential skills and the importance of that, and I wondered if you could talk a bit about that. Well, many things I could say about that. Uh, number one, the plus. If you look at uh, OECD rankings of education systems, uh, the Canadian primary and secondary system does pretty well. In fact, amongst English-speaking countries, it's number one. Um, not quite in the league with Finland, uh, with uh, Singapore, with uh, several of the Chinese cities, Shanghai, for example, Hong Kong, South Korea, etc. But we, we fare well in English-speaking countries, uh, particularly in literacy skills, a little less in numeracy skills. We're sliding though, and we could do a lot better than that. Um, uh, that to me comes down to great teachers. In my installation address, which was entitled <clears throat> A Smart and Caring Country, and both adjectives are important, a call to service, I said if you remember only three words of what I say today, they are cherish our teachers, because apart from the family influence, that's where things learn. And what I really worry about is, is the, the kids that are left behind, the kids that don't have any books in their home, uh, I co-chaired Centraid United Way in Montreal one year and I thought I knew my city. I realized that one quarter of the young boys who came to school in East End Montreal where I was yesterday uh, are uh, unable to learn. They, they don't have the attention, uh, capacity to sit down. They've never seen a book, etc. One, one quarter in a city that I thought I understood. Those are the kinds of things that we must remedy and, and really cherish that formation uh, in our public system early on. I guess uh, I would say for, for skills uh, at, the, at the college and university level, I'm a great believer in, in experiential learning. Um, we often find employers would say, technically the students are pretty good, um, but what they lack is communication skills, both reading and writing. What they lack is a, a management of projects. What they lack is the team leadership. What they lack is the... Um, the collaborative nature to be able to work with people of different skills and different personalities, et cetera. Those are things that are hard to teach, although you can create an environment in a university setting where they're, where they're learned. But the best vehicle for developing those kind of skills is actual work experience. So I would not start a university tomorrow if it didn't have a substantial experiential learning component where theory and practice are going hand in hand, and you go through your entire life realizing that those two come together. One more question um, is, you mentioned the, um, the statistics by Universities Canada that talked about the third point, that students don't see the value, Canadian students don't see the value in studying abroad. And I find that surprising, shocking in fact, and I wonder um, if you might have some, some thoughts on that in terms of where that must, might come from and what we could do to change that attitude. Well, Julia, it's such a good question because I think that gets at the heart of the culture of innovation. To be part of a culture of innovation, you are thinking differently. You're thinking beyond your present circumstances. You're thinking like my football coach and history teacher said, this guy needs a little bit of uh, competition in his life. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we have to engender that curiosity, that sense of difference is interesting. I learn more, I expand more by, by doing it. I cited the example of my five daughters. I think the biggest single development in their formation, comme on dit en français, was this exposure to difference, particularly difference with different languages. One little story, 1980 at McGill, we went to Beijing to, after the Cultural Revolution just ended, to reestablish the Norman Bethune Medical Exchange. Bethune is a great hero, the Canadian in China with the Peking Medical Union Beijing University. And at that, <clears throat> we were there for four or five days, and the president of Beijing University was a distinguished uh, scientist who'd studied in the United States, and therefore during the, uh, the Cultural Revolution was sent to the worst situation imaginable. He was back in his office, he was a man about 75, and I said, you must have regrets for the last 20 years. He said, I have no time for regrets. I'm so honored to be back building, learning, and he said, you're the first university from the West that has come to reestablish relations with us. I will come and visit you. Didn't expect to. Six months later, he was in our home. We had a big banquet, a big dinner. He was missing from his chair at the table. Oh my heavens, he's become ill. I rushed from my chair. I heard voices up in the attic, the third floor. I went up there. There he was, cross-legged on the floor with our five daughters, eldest 11, down to three. He brought them calligraphy sets, and he was teaching them calligraphy. And the two eldest girls said, we will go someday and study 
that language, and they did. They spent, one was two years in China, and the other was a year and a half. They were lucky, I guess, to be exposed to that, but I think you have to engender that sense of different, and especially different beyond your comfort zone of your own language, et cetera. And we in the universities have the first responsibility to make those opportunities very enticing and to develop the creativity in the minds of our young people to say, hey, that's really not just a nifty thing to do, that's really an important thing to do. Okay, excellent. Please join me in welcoming um, the Governor General, uh, His Excellency David Johnson, for his remarks this morning. Thank you.